Uh, do you look him in the eyes? What do you see? No, I look at him. I see him from the side, and as I get up to go buy something out of one of the machines, I look at him, and he's clean-shaven, hair well-groomed, laughing, hair, legs crossed, you know, very calm demeanor. Not, and if it were me, I wouldn't want to see anybody and pray to Christ that I would die every day. How come the guys in the prison like him? Why do they not hurt him? Michael, that's a sixty-four dollar question. <laughs> I don't know. I can't answer that. Were they warned to stay away from him by certain elements? Those elements are the ones that are hanging out with him. Ah, uh, interesting. Uh, we'll leave it at that then. We'll leave it at that. Thank you, and have a wonderful Super Bowl weekend. Uh, I'm sure I'll watch it for a minute or two along the way. I have to as an American. I have to talk about it. And it's just that uh, people like it. It's okay. It's an Americana thing. I'm sure they're worried about the uh, wonderful uh, uh, visitors who may want to blow the place up. Mosquito expert says Washington is downplaying the Zika virus threat to the United States, but no one cares about it. That's all. Hillary's son-in-law manages a hedge fund. No one says a word about it. Instead, she makes believe she's attacking Wall Street. So it's very difficult when you're a realist like I am to take any politician very seriously, to be very frank. Here's an example. Last night listening to the debate, and I, I found myself listening to it even though I didn't think I would, and I, I was captivated by it. It was watching something that was very theatrical for many reasons. Here is the commie Sanders talking about Teddy Roosevelt in clip 1919. Please, Robert. We do need a 21st century Glass-Steagall legislation. And I would tell you also that when you have three out of the four largest banks in America today, bigger than they were, significantly bigger than when we bailed them out because they were too big to fail. I think if Teddy Roosevelt were alive today, a good Republican, by the way, what he would say is break them up. They are too powerful economically. They are too powerful politically. And that is what I believe and many economists believe. Time to break them up. Okay, he gave a spritz on that one. It comes from the, it comes from the Teddy Roosevelt motto, Bust the Trusts, which was very popular f because of his, his statement, Bust the Trusts. And that was his motto, bust the trust. So it sounds very appealing. And he says it's too big and they're too powerful. Makes sense to you, right, if you're an idiot? Well, let me ask you a question. How come you're silent on big government? Pharmaceutical companies are too big. Uh, banks are too big. Uh, what? Let's see, what else is too big? Banks are too big. Pharmaceutical companies are too big. PACs are too big. Oil companies are too big. But you never hear the government is too big? I would say bust the government up rather than bust up the companies. Let someone say bust up the government better. Break it apart and I'll vote for them. That's what I'm saying. How come you don't say it? Because that's what you listen for is for me to say it. That's what you're paying for. That's why I eat the good food in order to think. Life after the NFL. Super Bowl hero Joe Montana can't run struggles with other activities. That's a sad story, but it's very well accepted. It's what I said earlier. It's uh, a wimp's world. It's all the years that I didn't play football. I thank God for it right now. Because I couldn't play football. I mean, in the truth, I would have been killed if I played football. Did I ever tell you the story that I wanted to be a boxer? My father discouraged me. Did I tell you that story? Can I do it in three minutes or less? Oh, it's a great story. It's a sad story. I wrote it up once. Maybe I should get the story because it's a, I wrote it with pathos rather than the way I'm going to tell it now. Maybe I should go dig it up. I think it was called The Knockout. The Knockout, I was like, I'll tell you the story in my own way. So... My father was a boxing fan. My uncle was a boxing fan. We watch it on Friday nights, the Friday night fights with, uh, I think it was Gillette, and they'd hum the songs, whatever. My uncle would, would sing the song. I'd see him on the couch to this day, God rest his soul, watching the fights. And So my uncle, who lived in Manhattan, had a friend, an African-American, who was a light heavyweight, and he was a contender for the title. And he was supposed to appear in the Yankee Stadium, I believe, in a... Uh, uh, an undercard event on the light heavyweight, uh, you know, card. It was a big thing. It was this huge step up, right? So this guy was my hero, and I got to know him. Of course, I looked up to him because kids love fighters. You got to understand something about boys. All boys love fighters. All boys love athletes. All boys love warriors. They look up to them for good reason because instinctually they know that they're the defenders <laughs> of the tribe. So as I got to speak to this guy, I told him, he was a skinny kid. I said, look, I want to learn how to box. 
He didn't laugh at me. He didn't say you're too small or too skinny or you'll get killed. He said to me, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He said, I want you to go out and get this, that, and the other, you know, certain shorts and whatever men wear, protection and this and that. He said, you're going to take the train up to Harlem, he said. You're going to go there and you're going to train on every Wednesday or something. He told me the A train and this and that. And he said, I'll teach you how to fight. Don't worry about it. So I was so happy. It was one of the happiest moments of my whole life. Wow, finally, a professional boxer is going to take me under his wing. And he's going to send, and he was going to, he, I was supposed to learn to box in the Salem Crescent AC, which is probably one of the greatest training gyms in America. At least it was then. And anyone out there knows what I'm talking about in the fight world. So here I was, the skinny kid from Queens. I was going to go up to Harlem and learn how to fight from guys in the Salem Crescent AC and be protected by him. Well, when I come back, I'll tell you what happened right here on the Savage Nation. All right, so let me finish the knockout story. I'll make it simple. So the, the uh, African-American boxer, he was going to take me under his wing, Salem Crest and AC. I was going to ride the subway, God knows, three trains, switch to the A train, go to Harlem, and learn how to box. And he got the head thing, the that, the that, the that. So I was thrilled. So my father comes home, and I tell him what's going to happen. And guess what? Uh-uh, he didn't let me do it. He said, you're not doing it, and he stopped me from doing it. Now, I re I resented this my entire life until recently when I realized it wasn't really made for me. And I look at this story, Super Bowl hero Joe Montana can't run and struggles with, with other activities, and I see so many guys who were great athletes, really tough, strong men, and in many, many sports, who were broken up by age 50, if not sooner. And I realized that in many ways, my father was doing me a favor. I mean, it injured me emotionally. Truthfully, I'd rather be knocked out with a punch than knocked out by my father's f overprotection. Let's put it to you that way. But it really wasn't done in a nice way. He didn't exactly say, son, I love you and I don't, don't want you to get hurt. It was done in such a mean, sarcastic way that a punch in the nose that knocked me cold would have been easier than that. But nevertheless, let's put that aside. There are other instances. When I went to college, I took up judo the first year. And I found that when I was getting thrown to the mat, of course, I learned to fall. And it later on saved me from a fall off a bicycle because I learned to roll in instinctually. You know, I fell off a bike and threw my hand out and rolled on. I learned how to roll instead of falling hard. That was great. <clears throat> but I was, getting re I was getting repeated headaches from the judo. Every time I got slammed to the mat, I'd get a headache. What did I learn from that? I gave up judo. Why? Because I probably would have had brain damage within a few years. My body is not made for that kind of impact. And so you sometimes, you know, you have to listen to who you are rather than who you want to be. It's that simple. Nature often doesn't make mistakes. Sometimes it does, but most of the time it doesn't. And we're all kind of perfect if we know who we are and we live the life that we're supposed to live according to how we were made. Now, I realize in this age of we can be anything and we can remake ourselves, that doesn't hold water. Many people uh, want to be something they're not, and they do make lives for themselves where they're not what they were originally made. And so that's the world of today, but I disagree with it. It's that simple. Now let's go to the callers on the Savage Nation. MAC Radio. Doug, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? I was just going to call you. Uh, asked a couple times about uh, why convicts look up to Bernie Madoff. Uh, my experience over about 35 years in American corrections is that con men have always been at the top of the pecking order in prison. Child molesters are at the bottom, and others are scattered through. But that's con men have so, always been so. In other words, if a person has a criminal intent or a criminal personality, they're going to look to the guy who ripped off the most money as 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 a hero. Exactly. And were you in corrections on the, as a jailer or as as a prisoner? Jailer. As a jailer, so you've, you've gotten to study the personalities of the, of the convicts. Right. Interesting. Well, all right, there you go. So crime pays. Well, crime pays if you go to jail is what he's saying. In other words, you have a useful tool for them. They're going to learn from you how to, how to rip people off. All right, so he's having a good time in jail. He had no conscience. The man is a, a, you know, asocial, has no conscience. I still ask why the wife got $2.5 million given to her by the trustee, so-called. How can you trust a trustee who takes a billion dollars in, in, in legal fees? You know, wasn't someone looking into that? Someone's going to look into that, right? Who? Who's going to look into that? What? The government should look into that. You know, I love it. The government should look into that. Yeah, what government? The Larry David government that we have right now. 855 400 
VLK, Jim, go ahead, please. What's your comment? Well, I was, I'm a physician, and there's good evidence that just what you said, when chiropractic manipulation damages the arteries in the back of the neck, most strokes come from problems in the front vessels of the neck, but there are two small arteries in the neck in the back, and they can be damaged. So I attended a conference some years mm. ago where the head of neurology at Peter Bent Brigham discussed a look-back study of patients who had strokes in that distribution of the arterial supply, and 40% had had neck chiropractic manipulation. Oh. In the yeah, I, have, I have a hard and fast rule, Doc, that no one manipulates my spine or my neck. They want to give me a foot rub, fine. A scalp rub, fine. No neck manip manipulation. <laughs> Thanks for the call. I'm going to look into the arteries in the back now. Now I'm worried about that. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. One wonders if this were a white suburban community, what kind of response there would have been. Flint, Michigan, Flint, Michigan is a poor community. It is disproportionately African American and minority. Oh, shut and up, you communist street rag. Shut up. Shut the communist street rag. Get him off my show. Race warfare. She she pushes uh, class warfare. He pushes race warfare, and you're going to vote for a Democrat. These are the lowest form of politicians imaginable. They are the demagogues from the gutter. Again, Flint, Michigan is based on racism. You hear this? Oh, boy, it never ends, does it? When have the Democrats not been a party of division? When, did that, when was that uh, ever different? Okay, so what's in the news? What's in the news? You heard all the news? No, you haven't heard all the news. Lots of news. Jeb and Barbara Bush say Trump has a filthy mouth. You know it's desperate in the Bush world when they bring out Barbara Bush, who was once famously uh, reported as saying, to one of the sons who didn't want to run again, and I think it was the last president, she said, I'll kill you if you don't run again. So I don't think that she uh, is too happy that Jeb is so low in the, you know, in the results department and that the uh, Bush dynasty is coming to an end as a ruling oligarchy. I think she was looking forward to another, another big eight, you know. Let's see, this thing on the sickly sea lion pup found sleeping in a restaurant booth is an interesting one. And look, it's a family show, but I'm not reading a headline that I wrote. But I, I can't tell you that I'm not amused by this story. I saw it this morning in the New York Post. I see a New Zealand politician standing up there, and what appears to be a... Uh, I don't know how to put it other than this. Okay, the headline is, Flying Penis Hits New Zealand Official at Trade Deal Protest. I said, what? You look at this picture, someone got the exact moment you see, there was a protester who opposed the um, very same TPP that Obama has just gotten passed, the highly secretive Trans-Pacific Partnership Economic Agreement. So this female did not like the fact that the politician supported it. So she threw what is known as a sex toy in his face. And th the picture catches it, hit him, hitting him right in the head as he's speaking. Now, I watched this this morning and laughed hysterically. I laughed for a number of reasons. I mean, people are asking why she thought a sex toy was the right way to protest. In my opinion, I think it's an excellent way to protest. Uh, I don't want to go into details on this one, but I put it up. Here's, I show you what people. I will show you in an instant what people are, will, will respond to. I have a Facebook.com Michael Savage account. Okay, everyone has a Facebook account, so I put various and sundry things up, pictures and stories. I put this up, and I got 129,853 people who are reached since it's gone up. You look at other stories. Um, Obama picked it as murderous devil in downtown Moscow, 25,000 people. I wrote last night, try to imagine Bill Clinton as first lady. That was during the debates. I was being sarcastic. 27,000 people. People liked it, but okay, 27,000. Earlier, I wrote, why does Hillary smile when she is beaten? How many surgeries has it taken to fabricate those cat cheeks. She is so despicable that she is making the commie look reasonable. I got 24,000 people reply to that. And, and giving you an example, here's a one on Zika. You think it's a serious story, right? Zika virus prompts Florida governor to declare emergency in four counties. 38,000 people responded to it. My book, 
uh, diseases without borders. Again, a low.